Okay, good evening everybody. Pleasure to see you all joining the webinar this evening. I'm speaking to you from a very dark, wet and cold Wales tonight. So I hope that you're somewhere that's a little less brutal than the weather here at the moment. So this evening, I'm going to talk to you about class two restorations. Um, and I'm just going to give um, people a few minutes to join, make sure that we've got everybody with us before we move on. Um, if you have any problems at all, then you can communicate with the webinar organizers through the chat. So my name is uh, Professor James Field. I'm a professor of restorative dentistry and dental education, and I'm a consultant in prosthodontics in the University Hospital Wales, which is uh, in partnership with Cardiff University. A real pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, you've got me for around about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and thank you to Dents by Serona um, for asking me to speak. So here we are on a slightly better day, a slightly better evening um, in Cardiff. This is the, uh, the area around the bay. And the first thing you might be wondering is, well, why me? Why am I speaking to you this evening? Um, I've worked with Dents by Serona for a long, long time. Um, on various projects, um, materials and equipment development, but also a lot of um, delivering of CPD as well. It's something which I really enjoy doing um, and, and I get a lot out of as much as hopefully uh, you folks do too. So I'm also the Director of Learning and Teaching at Cardiff Dental School. Uh, you can probably see some of my grey hairs that come from that role as well. Um, but that keeps me in the loop in terms of, of how we deliver our education at undergraduate and postgraduate level. And hopefully some of that um, comes across in the way that I'm talking this evening. Um, a lot of the things that I'm wanting to talk about are not necessarily groundbreaking, but as busy practitioners, we often forget to go back to some of the fundamental principles. So I'm going to take some time to do that as well this evening. A part of my role is as an honorary NHS consultant um, for NHS Wales, um, and that's in the same hospital that we have the dental school. So as I say, I've been working with Dents by Serona and other companies as well for many years to develop their workflows, but it's a real pleasure to be here with you tonight to talk about class two restorations. Um, I, I need to say as well that I'm being paid by Dents by Serona to give this talk. Um, so you'll notice there's a very heavy focus, of course, on the Dents by Serona product range. Um, we actually use that product range um, in Cardiff anyway um, for our undergraduate and our postgraduate education uh, for a number of the reasons that I'm going to talk about tonight. So what's the plan for this evening? Well, I'm going to have a recap over the current materials that we use for class two restorations. And I'm also going to talk about some of the advantages of bulk fill materials versus traditional layering of composites. And I'm going to talk about some of the survival characteristics of bulk fill restorations. And I'll make reference to one of Dents by Serona's products, SDR Flow, Flow Plus, um, which is their bulk fill flowable um, product, which I'll talk about in context a bit later on. Um, unlike what I tend to do on a day-to-day -day basis, this is not a particularly academic session. It's not heavy with papers and literature, um, and that's purposeful. It's to remind you of the fundamental approaches to caries management and the potential benefits of some of the newer and more innovative products that are coming along onto the market. So um, I know that the, the last thing that any of you probably want to do on an evening um, is to start uh, getting really deep into the literature um, and the other point that I'll, I will make and just, just get it out there is that, is that often the, the strength of the literature in dentistry um, is not particularly good either. Um, so we can always find studies to, to back up our approaches one way or the other, but they're not particularly robust a lot of the time. If we really want to fundamentally change our practice, um, then we start to critique papers and we realize that there's always some way in which we could, we could be critical of the way they've been done or make the point that it doesn't necessarily apply to the way in which we do things in our own practice. So we should be respectful of the literature, but we should also bear in mind that a lot of dentistry is based on practical experience and practical skill and how the different algorithms of products and, and equipment work 
in our own hands. So we find ourselves in dentistry in quite a unique situation um, for that reason. Um, a big Star Wars fan, you may see some references to this as we go through, but CPD can be pretty boring. Um, I'm hoping tonight that it's not, but there's always the potential for things to just get a little bit dry. So we'll try and keep things interesting as we go through. Hopefully tonight won't be too painful um, and we can have a little bit more, perhaps, of a lighthearted discussion um, about things, as I say, rather than things getting too heavy. But I have purposefully chosen the content for this so that it makes the point um, about reinforcing concepts um, and also the decision making around whether you operatively intervene with class two um, carious lesions or not. I guess the first thing then that we need to talk about is minimally invasive dentistry. And, and that's been described as a systematic respect for natural tooth tissue. And, and by systematic, it means that it has to permeate everything that we do, the decisions that we make, the treatments that we offer, um, the risks and benefits that we talk about with the different treatment options. Um, it can't be just one thing. It has to be a systematic approach um, to respecting natural tooth tissue. I think it's probably fair to say nowadays that this, this is taught all the way through undergraduate education and postgraduate education. Um, and we're moving away from perhaps some of our older approaches uh, where we were more readily removing tooth tissue. Um, doesn't mean we can't do that anymore, um, but we're more respectful now of, of um, you know, retaining healthy or partly affected tooth tissue. But what does it actually mean um, on a patient by patient basis? Because presumably being minimally invasive for one patient doesn't necessarily mean that you will be as minimal for another. But in my mind, it means not operatively removing tooth tissue when it's not necessary. And of course, we can debate the term necessary, but hopefully tonight I'll put some context um, onto what we mean by that. In some patients, removal of tooth tissue will be necessary for various reasons. And in some patients, there is no real justification for removing extra tooth tissue. This is a patient uh, of mine from the hospital who suffers from amelogenesis imperfecta. And they've had attempts over many years to try and preserve tooth tissue. The approach so far has potentially been as minimally invasive as it could be. We don't often see cases like this in primary care um, or that are managed in primary care, but you can see a combination of different interventions that have been made here. Um, but the, the dentition is still failing. We have restorations which are still being lost. They're not bonding properly to tooth tissue because of the way in which the enamel and the dentine are affected. And we've got teeth which have been historically restored in a fairly conservative way, which now need to be um, intervened with to make things more satisfactory for the patient, especially as they enter their teenage years. So what's minimal for this patient um, is, is not the same as what's minimal for any other patient. And actually in this case, uh, the, the treatment outcome in the end, and I don't often do this, but was essentially um, extra coronal, sometimes three quarter, but mostly full coverage restorations across pretty much the entire dentition. Um, and that's pretty much as minimal as I could make it, um, wanting things to last a long time, of course. But if we go back to more normal patients, um, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, we can think about the more traditional idea of minimally invasive dentistry. But you can see here when we look at the different aspects of the arches, um, we have situations where no restorative materials are being retained successfully because of the way the tooth tissue has been affected. Um, and this brings me back to my point before about it having to be patient specific. So what guidelines do we have that uh, lead us down this minimally invasive dental route? Um, largely, I'm going to be talking about guidelines here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and you may have guidelines in your own countries which help you to provide um, appropriate decision making for minimally invasive dentistry. We have the International Caries Classification and Management System, which you may or may not be aware of. And I've put the QR code here on the screen so you can take a moment 
to follow that through. Um, what you'll find when you get there is a very comprehensive website um, and a very long document which details all of the approaches behind Kerry's classification and management. And it's quite a lot to take on board. What it's talking about is very appropriate. Um, but to actually sit and take the time to get your head around what this is saying um, can take a bit of a bit of time and can be a bit of a challenge. Um, something perhaps if you're having trouble sleeping at night that you might want to start reading this very long document. But towards the end of the document, there are some very nice summary tables um, and pictures that um, you can visit uh, to help you understand the decision making around uh, when to operatively intervene or not. And what other options do we have? Well, this also links to minimally invasive approaches where instead of traditionally just operatively removing affected tooth tissue and replacing it with a restorative material, we're now looking to infiltrate with resin, demineralized or slightly affected uh, enamel and dentine lesions to seal and to arrest that carious process. And these show real promise. They've been around now for a while, quite technique sensitive, but do have a place. Um, easier to use in some senses on smooth surface, but are designed also to be used approximately, which is what we're talking about tonight. So if we look at the clinical aspects of ICCMS, I'm, I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk through the different codings. If you are well aware of these already, then that's fantastic. Um, I don't come across that many primary care practitioners in the UK who are very well versed or familiar with ICCMS, but it's a very good way of um, in your record keeping of detailing the extent of carious lesions. Often we find that um, our electronic patient record system doesn't really allow us to record a grading for caries. Um, but if you have the opportunity to put these things in, then it will help your notes to be more comprehensive um, and allow you to better communicate the, the extent of the carious process with colleagues. So the ICDAS code zero is sound surfaces. So they show no evidence of caries. Um, and they are clean, um, and this is when they are air dried and well lit. Um, so you can see some pictures there of what this looks like, and on the guidance you can zoom in onto those pictures to make them a, a bit bigger. Obviously we're excluding staining um, and other pitting, attrition, abrasion and erosion here. Um, this is really just looking at the carious process. As we start to get uh, the very first or, or distinct visual changes in enamel, which might be as the enamel becomes affected, it affects the translucency, it becomes more opaque, more chalky, which could look slightly white or slightly brown. Um, and this would be given a code one or code two. Um, at the moment though, there is no surface breakdown. There's no dentine that's visible underneath. This is still an intact lesion. If we look at the later um, ICDAS codes, we can see that code three and four is moderate lesion. And here you can see on the picture that we have this developing white or brown spot lesion. We start to get some very localized enamel breakdown, but we still don't have frank visible dentine exposure. We don't have collapse of this enamel layer with the underlying dentine beneath being visible. You can start to look at whether enamel is broken down or not with a probe. A ball-ended probe is particularly good because um, it, it's less likely to puncture into lesions. Uh, but you can explore the surface with the ball-ended probe to see if it's dropping down into any what are called micro cavities or discontinuities. And as we get to five and six, then this is very extensive. Uh, we have opaque or very discolored enamel. We have visible dentine because the protective enamel layer has collapsed. And it's at stages three, four, five, six, where we start to see um, lesions very rapidly progressing in teeth. Um, there's a bit of a misconception, I think, that we can patch over 
um, these uh, even non-cavitated lesions and they will arrest. Uh, but you need to have very good control over the margins of the lesion and a hermetic seal. Otherwise, these lesions will progress. I remember when I was taught at dental school, I was under the impression for many years in practice that glass ionomer, because of its fluoride content and as a relatively smart material, would help me. And, and placing a glass ionomer or a resin modified glass ionomer would help me to treat active carious lesions. And I realized very quickly that that's not the case. Um, these lesion, lesions often still rapidly progress. And this is one of the reasons why we need to look at the evidence for at what point we should intervene operatively to at least clear the ADJ, possibly to remove some of the affected dentine underneath and to place a well sealing restoration, uh, which has integrity um, and has longevity as well. So if we look at the radiographic aspects of ICCMS, this is quite useful because it starts here to show you some of the examples of the different initial stages. And you can see on the screen here, we've got RA1, 2, and 3. At the moment, the early RA1 grading is talking about a radiolucency in the outer half of the enamel. And as that progresses through to the inner half of the enamel, reaching the ADJ or the EDJ, um, and then for RA3, we've got a radiolucency, which is clearly into dentine, but limited to the outer third. I get a lot of questions as well um, from students, postgraduate and undergraduate, but also uh, visiting practitioners about interpretation of radiographs. Um, and I'm not a radiologist, but I think it's really important to, um, to understand that we must report on what we actually see on a radiograph. A lot of the time I find that people are quite hesitant to make a decision one way or the other about how something is presenting. But be reassured in the knowledge that all you can do is report on what you actually see on a radiograph and what you actually see clinically to bring them together to make a diagnosis. I do see a lot of people diagnosing caries um, and pathology from radiographs but actually all you can do is report radio opacities and radio lucencies and then go and investigate clinically to make a diagnosis of any particular pathology. And I think when you start to take that philosophy, you're more likely to find appropriate um, diagnoses than if you really think that you have to make a diagnosis looking at a radiograph alone, for example. So always ask yourself, you know, is this radio lucency in a fairly typical place? If we're talking about a proximal carious lesions, then this will be at or just below the contact point. And you will see this puncturing through the enamel as it moves towards the dentine. And as it reaches the dentine, you will see that lesion mushroom out as that really rapidly progresses as it reaches a much less resilient tissue um, than enamel. So again, this document is useful because it's showing you the typical presentations um, of how caries presents um, in teeth. If we look at the moderate and extensive stages, then you can see here we've got radiolucencies reaching the middle third of dentine um, and further um, towards the pulp. Um, and obviously it's very, it's very easy to see clinically cavitated lesions on a radiograph. What I will say though, um, and this might be your experience too, is that the moderate stages can easily be missed as the lesion grows in size, it actually starts to become sometimes less defined visually on a radiograph. And this can be one of the problems of looking at radiographs um, in a very magnified way on your computer screen. So I personally don't like to enlarge periapical radiographs, for example, to the full size of my screen, because I find that I have the potential to miss lesions um, which are presenting in a moderate way and actually keeping the radiograph slightly smaller allows, certainly allows me to make better judgments. And certainly for very extensive stages that have cavitated, um, you can be mistaken sometimes for thinking that these are actually radiographic burnout. So again, it's important to look at the, the neighboring dentition to see if those artifacts are happening across the neighboring aspects of the radiograph as well, or whether actually what you're seeing is, is localized to that particular tooth. 
Very helpfully, the document combines the clinical and the radiographic findings into a table so you can judge how extensive um, your lesion is. So we're looking at, at sound enamel, initial, moderate and extensive lesions clinically, and we're looking at the RA, RB and RC radiographic um, lesions to decide whether your lesion in a combined way is sound, initial, moderate or extensive. So even if nothing more than you're just recording the extent of the carious lesion, I think that's really, really important. So the question then, the golden question is, when and what should I make as an intervention? Um, so I've classified my carious lesion, but how should I make a decision about what to do? And this is where the document looks quite complicated because what it's trying to tell us all is what the recommended intervention is and at what level the evidence is um, for us to make that judgment. So, you know, evidence level one um, or the highest level of evidence can be attributed to certain decision-making aspects. And you can see here that with minimally active lesions um, that we're looking at resin-based sealants or infiltrants, um, we're looking at glass ionomer sealants and we're looking at preventive measures oral hygiene measures, fluoridated toothpaste, topical fluoride application and removal of plaque. That makes sense, that's what we know, that's what we do. But you'll notice as we move further down that we start to see the term TPOC, which is tooth preserving operative care, which to you and me means picking up handpiece and removing some tooth tissue, um, being as minimal as possible being as minimally invasive as possible. So you can see here with a moderately active lesion, um, the, the expectation is that we would intervene um, if we've got cavitation. And you can see here, we've got sign level one, um, if there are signs of cavitation, um, and we've graded this as moderate, uh, that we should be doing that. Um, and you can also see here that um, there might be a, a historical and inactive lesion, but there is still just cause for operative intervention if the lesion is a stagnation area or it is a concern for aesthetic reasons for the patient. So I guess what I'm saying here is that we need to be minimally invasive, but there are still many, many reasons why we need to operatively intervene um, with teeth. Um, and and in, in that relation, particularly class two posterior restorations. So my happy place now, let's talk about those operative interventions. Let's talk about operative dentistry. Um, I've just put a picture up here of some of the 3D printed teeth that, that we work with, um, with some partners in the UK, which have simulated caries in different areas um, and we 3D print them, um, and these ones are from Plymouth actually, but we 3D print them with um, features that allow them to be retained in the jaws so that students can, uh, can operate on them. What I'd like to do first though is to try and put direct restorations in context. I'd like to just um, set the scene in terms of what we expect from restoration survival. And the caveat here, as I said before, is that the data um, in relation to perhaps wider medicine um, is often not particularly reliable. Sometimes we have big data, some of the data, and I think Trevor's here tonight, but some of the data, the big data he's looked at is, is more reliable in context, but actually on balance, we don't have great data. But let's just put some of these ballpark figures up. So, you know, how long would we expect a cantilevered conventional bridge to last? Um, you know, how many of those would be surviving at 10 years? Um, the figure would be around 80%. We know that if we cantilever um, with a conventional bridge, though, from a root treated tooth, we know that that survival at 10 years drops significantly to just over 50%. Um, and, you know, we can talk later about the reasons for that. We, we now understand or better understand the reasons for that happening. If we look at one of the best performing restorations on natural teeth, the fixed fixed conventional bridge, we don't do so many of these anymore because we're trying to be conservative. But actually at 10 years, nearly 90% of those restorations will still be in the mouth and will still be functioning very well. 
And with that in mind, we also think about the risk of loss of tooth vitality after preparing for a full crown. We look at the work by Daniel Edelhoff about you know volumetric reduction for crown preparations. And when you are reminded that in preparing for a PFM crown on a premolar, you might remove you know at least three quarters of the volume of the crown, um, it's quite a significant insult, uh, physical insult for the tooth. And yes, we don't often prepare teeth from their normal form in that way, but it's still important to understand how much volume we're losing from the crown when we do that. 10 years is a good study length. 80% is a very good number to remember. The average post uh, crown is going to last, um, you know, there's 80% chance of survival at 10 years and similar for resin bonded bridge. So we tend to get aggregations of restorations around those figures. And I've just put some, you know, partial denture in there, um, survival around 70% at 10 years. Um, and one of the best single restorations, again, that we can provide is a single PFM crown on a healthy tooth, which, you know, 96% of those restorations uh, from the Pieterson studies will be, will be surviving at 10 years. What I find particularly interesting is that implant survival is very similar um, at 10 years, but be aware that also when we look at some of the large studies from the States, for example, with several million teeth, um, a root treated tooth survival is also very, very good. So we have to be careful that we're not mis-selling on occasions uh, implants versus root treatment because we talk about root treatment um, success, not survival, but we often talk about implant survival. So if we actually look at root canal treated tooth survival, which of those teeth are still in the mouth, it's often actually better um, outcomes than dental implants. So again, this is how we, we deliver this risk to our patients. It's how we interpret the literature, but we have to be a little bit careful about survival versus success. And here we are. The reason that I've been talking about these things is because we have a very variable um, range of survival for direct restorations. And that's because of the number of materials we can use. It's because of the number of techniques and different equipment um, that we have to use. Um, and if you think about the fact that that's changing over time as well, um, you know, new materials come out all the time, we start to use them, other ones go out of favor, new developments come along. Direct restorations is such a rapidly changing um, you know, modality in a way which some of the other disciplines aren't. And that's why we see such a large discrepancy. But we can nudge our success more towards the higher end of this range by really thinking about the things that we're talking about tonight. So let's think about the clinical requirements for, for posterior restorations. When you're in your practice, you often will make decisions um, on behalf of your patients, which don't you don't feel warrant a discussion. It's kind of a micro decision making. You're kind of deciding about how to do things. You're deciding about the equipment you're going to use. Um, you're deciding in some respects about the the materials. You might not be deciding amalgam versus glass ionomer versus composite, for example but you might have already decided which kind of bonding technique you're going to use or which bonding materials um, or which polishing techniques. Um, it's always fascinated me at what point we should stop and have a discussion with the patient. Um, you know, where is that line in the sand with what is, is the decision in our head as opposed to a decision that we should be making with the patient. Um, normal convention would suggest that we're quite happy to talk to the patient about material choice, you know, restorative material. We don't often talk to them about much else. But largely, the material that you're going to use is determined by the clinical situation. So you'll think about your ability to isolate the lesion. You'll think about where the margins are located. Um, you'll think about the type of tooth tissue that your margin is on. You might think about uh, how you're going to load the restoration or what it's opposing. And of course, the aesthetics as well. And as you'll see a bit later on, the the patient factors are important in, in terms of outcomes, in terms of risk, uh, risk for tooth wear, risk for parafunction, risk in terms of the patient's oral hygiene even. Um, and then we also have the patient's tolerance for a procedure. So 
Uh, Dentsply has provided some information here about what, what they feel is the most important factor when achieving a successful class two restoration. And they try to categorize this into an ideal situation um, and a less than ideal or a non-ideal situation. So you can see that in an ideal situation, um, it's felt that um, excellent adaptation of the material to the cavity at the margin is the most important factor when everything else is being controlled. That would allow you to have um, a restoration which doesn't leak, it doesn't cause sensitivity, it doesn't degrade, um, and is able to be kept clean. But if you think about a non-ideal situation, so perhaps we have poor oral hygiene, we have um, less ability to control the oral environment, um, we might have um, some restorations which are going subgingivally, you can see here that it's felt the most important factor to achieve a successful restoration is the material's tolerance to contamination from moisture. And I think that's a really important point because if we have bleeding gingival tissues or we have a restoration which is going to extend subgingivally um, or we find it less easy to control um, saliva um, or to isolate um, the lesion that we're working on, then our attention turns to which material is going to be most tolerant of that environment, of that um, moisture. Um, and a lot of people would err away from composite in those situations and would think about using traditionally amalgam, but increasingly materials like biodentine um, or glass, traditional glass aronimus cements. So what is our ideal clinical scenario for placing a posterior aproximal restoration? Well, ideally, we'd be able to isolate throughout the procedure, um, not just because it's more comfortable for our patients, but it does help us to control the environment. Um, we want enamel wherever possible at the periphery. It gives us the best um, and most controllable peripheral seal. And we'd like our margins to be super gingival and accessible. We'd like our gingival tissues to be healthy um, and we'd like a patient who is tolerant um, of the time it takes to place the restoration. Um, and as you'll see tonight, there are various options for materials which take uh, shorter times or longer times, depending on, on the choice. In comparison, um, and I don't want to stress you out after you've had a long day in the clinic, um, reminding you of these situations, but you will all know from a day-to-day -day basis of those situations where you can't isolate, um, you don't have a margin on enamel, um, you have a margin which is subgingival, you've got bleeding gingival tissues, you've got a patient who's intolerant of the procedure or um, doesn't want to spend the time that you need um, to do this properly. Um, and that just makes things stressful. So what Dentsply, Serona, and of course other companies try to do is to, is to produce materials which allow you to overcome some of the parameters of the less than ideal clinical scenario. And some of the research that Dense Blasterone have done shows that uh, non-ideal clinical scenarios are occurring, you know, at least a quarter of the time um, in, in practice. So I don't want to labor this point too much because um, you're all practicing dentist and some of you very experienced at that but I just want to remind you of, of some of the reasons that we we might choose these different materials composite now is is often the main choice in fact um, in some of your countries you won't use amalgam anymore in some countries it's not taught anymore um, but composite is a good aesthetic compromise it has a good compressive strength it's hard and it can be used in lots of different applications and of course you can augment composite in a way which is less easy to do with the other materials. However, um, you do or you should follow a particular bonding protocol for composite. And it can be very difficult to shape, particularly um, on non-smooth surfaces uh, after curing. It does require good isolation and it only has a moderate tensile strength. So whilst it's good compressively and it's hard, um, it's not good in thin section. We've got a, a middle ground here, the glass ionoma or the resin modified glass ionoma, which is obviously self-adhesive and much more moisture tolerant. So it's quite easy to place 
and adjust. And of course, you can also augment that too. But the expense here is at much poorer physical properties. Um, you can see the compressive strength um, is, is sometimes half. Um, the tensile strength is sometimes a third. Um, and it's kind of, it's not too bad in terms of hardness, depends whether it's resin modified or not, but it, it can be relatively soft. Um, it doesn't look as good. It dehydrates easily. It becomes quite chalky. Um, and so we tend not to use it uh, for definitive restorations and certainly not in the aesthetic zone. And then we have our old friend amalgam. Again, some of you will not use amalgam anymore, but this was a very tolerant or is a very tolerant material um, of this less than ideal scenario that we're talking about. It's got very good compressive strength, but it's also got very good tensile strength, which means that sometimes you don't need to remove quite as much tooth tissue to leave a robust preparation. Um, and you can put amalgam into places where it will uh, be less likely to fracture. Um, if it's placed well, it's easy to carve back and it becomes uh, quite hard quite quickly. Um, and the final outcome um, is also a very hard material, much harder than, than composite. But obviously we've got issues here with aesthetics. It requires undercut or requires bonding into place and you can't easily augment it either. And the biggest reason, of course, uh, that we've stopped using it is, is environmental or health concerns. So um, appreciating the fact that you won't all use amalgam, I just want to spend a moment to go, to go through this because it's worth bearing in mind that amalgam is one of the materials which is determined by an international standard. You can see on here, 1559, um, and that standard determines how amalgam is produced and how it can be labelled as dental amalgam. And it means that it has to contain a certain amount of silver, a certain maximum amount of tin, um, and a certain maximum amount of copper. And of course, if you think back, if you studied amalgam to some of your dental materials days, um, what we're trying to do here is to reduce the gamma-2 phase in amalgam, which it, it results in creep and corrosion. We've got other materials and, and elements in amalgam as well, such as zinc as a scavenger. And you might be interested to know that the, the alloy, the powder alloy, contains a maximum of 3% mercury. And what the international standard says is that there has to be a limited dimensional change when this material has set. It also says that it has to have a certain compressive strength at one hour, 50 megapascals, and, and it has to be within 24 hours reaching at least 300 megapascals of compressive strength. There has to be a maximum level of creep in the material. And so when you're buying dental amalgam and it's CE marked uh, to the ISO standard, you know that it has to be doing those things. Very quickly, um, a lot of people uh, will bond amalgam into place. It saves you having to create a lot of undercuts uh, when you're preparing for it. And that's often done with a traditional glass ionomer, which is providing an ionic bond at the internal fit surface. And decades ago, this was taught uh, quite often. Um, you may have come across the Baldwin technique or the amalgam sandwich technique, which is where a glass ionomer was placed first of all into the cavity and then amalgam was packed in um, and it created a sandwich of amalgam with a periphery of glass ionomer um, which uh, resulted in a fairly well-retained restoration. But mechanically, this wasn't a particularly robust type of restoration and it fell out of favour. And now we have more modern bonding systems which contain MDP and PENTA and they facilitate resin bonding um, a lot more um, than using something with uh, that relies like a glass ionomer on ionic bonding. So there are some studies out there, there are some, I said, I promised you I wasn't going to put much um, academic or many academic things into here, but there's a Cochrane systematic review that shows that there isn't very good evidence. It only found one trial which was underreported, um, but that showed uh, no significant difference in moderate sized bonded amalgam restorations in terms of survival rates and marginal integrity in comparison to non-bonded. Um, Take from that what you will. Again, it's 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 just one underreported trial. Um, we don't have particularly good evidence there. And uh, a randomized controlled trial from 2016, looking at uh, 20, which isn't very many, um, of each type of restoration, 
looked at the sensitivity at three years and again found no significant difference between bonded amalgam and composite restorations although they found that the post-op sensitivity tended to decrease more for composites in the longer term. And the last one I'm going to show here um, is from 10 years ago now, but it's a retrospective cohort study looking at just over 200 restorations. And they were looking at sensitivity and failure rate at five years. And they found that the bonded amalgam had a slightly higher survival rate than the non-bonded amalgam. The biggest drive here, of course, for us not using amalgam was the Minamata Treaty. Um, and the European Parliament agreed back in 2017 to ratify the treaty, which was, uh, which was written in 2013, so 10 years ago now. And the whole point of this was to reduce the release of mercury into the environment. Um, and part of that meant a phase down, not a ban, but a phase down of dental amalgam. So what it meant was that um, only pre-dosed encapsulated amalgam could be used from 2019. And I'm going to show you on the screen here a number of other um, regulatory requirements. But if you're based in the UK, um, you may think, but we've done those things for a long time already. And that's very true. Um, we have certain authorities in the UK which have mandated these things for a while. And, and in some senses, we're very forward thinking. Um, there are some areas and pockets of, the, of Europe and the wider world where these things didn't happen. Um, and so the treaty forced um, the, the practice to change. So here we're talking about the use of amalgam separators. We're talking about the disposal of amalgam waste being handled properly. Um, and from January 2018, we're talking about not using amalgam in primary teeth or children under 15 or in pregnant or breastfeeding women. So, Enough about amalgam, we're going to talk about dental composite because really that's what uh, the focus for this evening is, or at least resin-based materials anyway. Um, so what's the most appropriate here is that this is also governed by an international standard, uh, 4049. And before you yawn too much, uh, there are some very good reasons that I want to talk about this. And it's because, again, the requirements uh, for your composites that you're buying uh, from your catalogues um, are quite clear. Pretty much all the composites that you're buying are a combination of a filler and a base resin. And the base resin is usually uh, methacrylate or acrylate based. The fillers have developed quite significantly over recent years. Um, sometimes, certainly in some of the dense glycerona materials, the spectra ST materials, the fillers are actually the cured composite itself, uh, which is often silane coated or silane coupled, which creates a very homogeneous material. Um, traditionally, um, you know, a few decades ago, uh, we had kind of um, lathe cut quartz, silicon, barium as fillers, which resulted in a, in a, a material which wasn't very easy to manipulate, um, had very easy crack propagation, um, and therefore the fracture or toughness of the material was significantly less. And you would find a lot of surface pitting and a lot of stains being picked up. Um, you find that the viscosity of the composites is determined uh, by a lot of different types of methacrylate. Um, so you can have um, some which are, are very thick, like black treacle, uh, very, very heavy, difficult to stir. And you can have some which are very thin, almost like petrol. Um, and they are mixed together in various ratios with the fillers to give you composites that behave in a certain way. You know, if you think about a flowable composite as opposed to a posterior packable composite, um, it isn't just about the percentage of filler. It's also about the type of um, methacrylate which is used um, as the base resin or the combinations of base resins. So your composites also have an activator and an initiator. What's really important to know is that by requirements, your composites have to have a minimum depth of cure of one and a half millimeters. That's why we often talk about um, building up composites in a layering technique. They also have to have a minimum 50% conversion of monomer. And I do think it's probably time that the ISO standards are updated. I think 50% conversion of monomer is low. Um, and I think that nowadays with the advances in materials and technology, that we can certainly have a better standard for the amount of conversion of monomers.
and there has to be a minimum of 80 megapascals of flexural strength and that's particularly important um, on occlusal surfaces um, because really what we're talking about here is the ability to with, withstand tensile stresses, flexural forces. There are two other categories which I think are really important. The first one is water sorption, which is where the composite will take water in to its resin matrix. Um, it can only do that a certain amount. The reason it does that, uh, the reason there's a limit for that is because that water um, in the resin matrix causes degradation. It causes degrading of the filler matrix interface and it causes discoloration of the composite and therefore the restoration. There's the water solubility as well, which is the amount of water which moves out of the matrix. And the reason this is really important is because it takes with it toxic substances from the uh, lack of conversion of the monomers. It takes with it formaldehydes, methacrylic acids. And as a community, we may have been concerned about the, the biological effects, um, or some people may have been concerned about the biological effects of amalgam. But I do think that there's much more to be observed about the biological effects of composites actually um, and the ways in which they can affect the body some of the work that uh, was done at sheffield university a number of years ago in the uk was looking at how quickly um, components from composites can be measured in patient urine after placement of dental restorations and uh, from what i can remember we can be measuring it from as little as half an hour later in patients urine so these these substances are you know potentially um quite difficult um, and quite worrying to manage and quite remarkably for me um i can't believe this but the iso standard for dental composite does not stipulate a polymerization shrinkage stress so we know that's one of the reasons that we get problems and sensitivity um, if we don't layer composites properly is the c factor we start to get pulling on the restoration walls because the shrinkage stress um, and it's not stipulated in the standard, but usually it ranges from um, just under 1% to, to around 3%. And again, as technology gets better, as you'll see later, uh, we have less cause um, to worry about that. Just quickly, I want to talk about uh, glass ionomers and resin modified glass ionomers. Really, these should be called uh, polyalkanoate cements. Um, they're also governed by um, an ISO standard and they're often mixed uh, together as a powder, which is often a powdered glass um, and a polyacrylic acid. So these are ISO 99171, just for anyone who's feeling particularly technical out there. And they have to have a setting time of two to six or two and a half to eight minutes, depending on their application. And they have to have a certain compressive strength um, when used as a restorative material, but also when used as a looting agent as well. They have to resist a certain amount of acid erosion too. And what most people forget is that really dentine should not be etched with phosphoric acid before placing a glass ionomer. It should be gently conditioned using a polyacrylic acid, which is often blue in colour. Um, but it's it's a lot weaker than phosphoric and it results in a much more appropriate uh, bond with the material. And as I said before, and as you're well aware, the glass ionomer should leach and release fluoride in acidic conditions. And in the early life of the restorations, it should recharge as well. Um, and as I said before, the big risk of glass ionomer really is dehydration. It, it's at risk of desiccation if we don't cover it with something which is resin or solvent based as a varnish. But what is very good about glass ionomer is that we get a chemical bond to enamel and dentine, uh, which is quite strong quite quickly and will continue to optimize over um, the next kind of 72 hours. And that's really a, a strong bond. You'll know because if you leave it on your metal instruments, it's very hard to get rid of glass ionomer again once it's set. So it can be very useful in the right applications. I'm just going to put a couple of studies up here about amalgam and composite uh, because, again, I think it's really useful to know these things. But there were some really interesting studies, um, again, coming up to 10 years ago now, looking at the type of fillers in composites, um, finer filler particles, 
resulting in in better wear resistance when as you might think it's the other way around um, and there's a, a lack of correlation between how hard a material is and how well it wears and that's because of the way the fillers behave uh, when they're being abraded away at the surface we find that finely more finely filled resins are less rough they pick up less stains and they lose less surface material because the finer resin filler doesn't detach as easily uh, and leave big pits on the surface uh, as the, um, the surface is abraded um, by different insults. Uh, there are some uh, lab studies uh, in the literature looking at incremental layering versus bulk fill chemical cures, um, showing that, that sometimes incremental light cured composites are better adapted at the margin. I would probably argue that I don't feel that's the case and, and you'll see later on why. Um, but they also show that some of the self-cured composites um, show more marginal degradation um, due to polymerization contraction. And there are some systematic reviews of the different materials that are being used. Um, some of these over a lot of different restorations show that amalgams present better outcomes. Um, but there is still insufficient data to su support one treatment over another. It has to be more of a patient-specific decision. But this is the most important point for me here is about marginal um, marginal degradation. You know, why is marginal failure important? Well, Hayashi's paper from 20 years ago uh, makes this very clear. Restorations with marginal degradation at three years are five times more likely to have failed by five years. And restorations that have both marginal degradation and discoloration were nine times more likely to have failed by five years. So we know that marginal integrity is incredibly important for our restorations. And that's what I'm going to talk about the workflows tonight and how they can improve the integrity, the marginal integrity of the restorations that we place. Finally, as well, uh, the studies, Opdam studies, I'd like to talk about this because um, there were some very good 12-year survival studies. They were retrospective, um, but they're basically showing that um, large composites um, have higher survival rates than amalgam when the caries risk is low. However, if your patients are at high risk of caries um, and they are three surface restorations or bigger, then amalgam shows better outcomes. And it's worth just thinking about that sometimes if you still use amalgam and to help you make decisions about what will have better longevity um, in your patients and how you can tailor it to be more patient specific. I'd like to put a slide in about cavity liners. Um, when I was at dental school, we were taught to line everything. It was like a big painting spree. We would just line those cavities um, with all sorts of different liners. But various um, reviews of the literature have now shown that that's not necessary. In fact, it's probably counterproductive. Um, if you're going to use a calcium hydroxide liner, it should only be in the deepest, darkest parts of your cavity uh, where your dentine thickness is, is less than half a millimetre. Um, and even then, you should always follow it with a protective layer of resin-modified glass ionomer. And that's because calcium hydroxide, even though it sets, um, is still water-soluble and it will leach out from your preparation um, particularly when you're using amalgam where you don't have an immediate peripheral seal. And traditionally, people were told that line is there to protect the pulp from toxic or chemical effects of restorative materials, but there's actually very little evidence that that's the case. Um, people are also told that they're used as therapeutic agents to seal tubules and to encourage tertiary dentine deposition, but there are lots of studies that show both laboratory and animal-based studies that um, tertiary dentine deposition will happen anyway, regardless of the material that's used um, as a liner. And there is a difference here between liners and suspension liners. So liners are materials that go in the very deepest part of a cavity, and that's quite a thick layer. It can be you know, up to half a millimeter thick, or should be. Suspension liners, though, are when we place a volatile solvent around the entirety of the walls of a cavity. And this is perhaps you know, how you might consider new or more modern bonded amalgams to be placed. Um, a very thin film 
you know, fifth of a millimeter, 20 to 25 microns covering the whole internal surface. So again, just to make the point that setting calcium hydroxide or dical um, is the most common. Again, this is a dense by product um, and it is antibacterial because of its pH, but it shouldn't be used um, in thick section. It's not thick enough to provide thermal protection. It does compromise your ability to bond resin to the tooth surface and you should not have it near the margin, anywhere near the margin of your restoration. Some of the studies out there looking at cavity liners are quite interesting. Uh, a randomized controlled trial in 30 children from 2016 looked at deep carious lesions in permanent molars um, and lined with glass ionoma or an inert wax, then restored with composite, basically showing caries arrestment occurs regardless of the lining material placed in contact with infected dentine. We know already that it's the peripheral seal that's the primary factor here. And again, if we look at OPDAM studies again, uh, retrospective studies, we can see that they suggest no significant effect of the placement of a GIC cavity liner on the outcomes of amalgam and composite restorations. And finally, animal studies, quite old animal studies now, looking at class five cavities restored with different materials. And um, when we look histologically at those, um, we see um, excellent pulpal responses for a range of materials, indicating that it doesn't really have to be um, a calcium hydroxide liner. And actually, again, an inert material like a wax can still, um, you know, you can still have the same physiological response to tertiary dentine deposition. So it's not really the material, it's the effect on the tooth tissue, um, the insult or the, the assault on the tooth tissue that's precipitating tertiary dentine. So cavity preparation, we're going to prepare a class two cavity for a restoration. What should we do? What do we need to do? Well, we need a restoration with um, enough uh, kind of material bulk that it's going to withstand the masticatory forces. Um, but what else does it need to do? Well, you need to need to clear the decay um, in the first place. But what should it be like? If I just give you 10 seconds, if you prepare a class two restoration on one of your patients, how are you thinking to yourself, whether it's a good preparation or not? Just very quickly have a little think about that. Whilst I have a drink of my coffee. What would it be like? Because for me, this is something which would clear the contact point. We'd have cavo surface angles of about 90 degrees to give us very robust margins. We would remove caries, uh, only the necessary parts of the carious lesion whilst protecting the pulp. We'd have a relatively flat floor. And some people say, but if I'm bonding composite, why do I need to have cavo surface angles of 90 degrees? Why do I need to have a relatively flat floor um, why do I need to have any undercut at all? And the answer is, well, you don't. But if you don't, you are almost entirely relying on your resin bond from resin to tooth structure to retain your restoration. And all the time that that restoration is being loaded, it's stressing the bond um, and especially at the margins. Now, if you've got a restoration which has axial support with a flat floor, it has robust cavo surface angles, then of course your resin bonding will help. But when your restoration is loaded axially or obliquely, um, so much of the resistance to movement also comes from tooth structure, which means that less reliance is placed mechanically on your resin bond. It's less likely to degrade. You're less likely to get marginal degradation and sensitivity and chipping and fractures. So, you wouldn't really want any unsupported tooth tissue. And as I said just now, if you've got it, keep it. You definitely would benefit from having some undercut. Of course, as well, we don't want to damage the adjacent tooth. And on that note, um, if we look 
um, if we think about you preparing for class two preparations, how often do you think that you do damage the adjacent tooth? Just have a little think for a minute of what the risk is. It's actually very high. Some of the studies that have been done in private practices, um, I think some of them are in Switzerland, showing um, that even with very careful preparations, um, there is inevitably always some kind of damage, even in a very minimal way, to the adjacent teeth. So I want to put some pictures up here to explain this a little bit. And it's often because our path of insertion, our axial approach to uh, the interproximal lesion is wrong. Um, and really, we need to be working down the long axis of the tooth. I see lots of, of uh, people operating, uh, sitting at the 12 o'clock position behind their patient. But um, actually, when they're preparing their class two preparation, they're either, the burr is either measly or distally angulated. Um, and as you can see here, if we angle the burr down the long axis and we leave a very thin protective sliver of enamel by the marginal ridge, then because of the shape of the tooth, we perforate through that window. You can see within the circle there further down, we can see how we perforate through and then we can break away this bridge of enamel to further refine the shape of our lesion without damaging the adjacent tooth. But if our burr is allowed to sit too mesially, then we don't damage the adjacent tooth, but we run the risk of endangering the pulp. We get poor straight line access for our instruments. And more importantly, you'll all be aware of this when it happens, but you have a very big lip of unsupported tooth tissue at the base of the cavity, which you can't remove any other way than going back in operatively with your handpiece, which results in quite a destructive preparation. Of course, if we angle our burr the other way, then we do damage the adjacent tooth, but also we fail to have any axial support for our restoration. And these types of restorations will fail very quickly. If you have no floor at all, um, yet they are axially loaded, then they will fail because the, the shear forces um, on the restoration are too great uh, for those to be resisted by the bonding um, to tooth structure. So it's actually worth being very critical of the way in which you're preparing for your class two preparations. And of course, the diagrams on the right are showing you that really we should introduce a flat floor with a little bit of undercut anyway. And here we're being slightly less um, minimally invasive to give a better outcome. Um, and that's a really important thing to consider is should you remove maybe, um, I don't know, two, 300 microns more uh, dentine in each direction to get a more robust restoration uh, than not. And of course, removing um, unsupported enamel and aiming for cable surface angles of 90 degrees. I've just put this slide up very quickly because what dent supply provide is what they call the root to crown solution. They provide products which um, on one hand uh, are involved with diagnosis and treatment planning all the way through um, to uh, root canal treatment of teeth, placement of direct restorations, but also placement of indirect restorations as well. So if you're unaware of the rest of the workflow, then you know take a trip to the Dense by Serona UK or Europe website um, and have a look at those different workflows because they do complement each other very well. Um, when you go down to the, the UK Dense by Serona um, office in Weybridge, you can see how proud they are of this workflow. They have it all out on display and in the big showroom, um, especially with all the digital technologies now and the digital workflows. But I'm gonna show you some products now, which I think help to do all the things I've just talked about with our class two restoration. And the first one is the Paladent system, which is a sectional matrix system. And I'm well aware there are other matrix systems out there. We teach a range of them um, in, in our institution. But our undergraduates um, and our postgraduates by default all use the Paladent system and have it as an option on the clinic because I think it's, it's actually a very easy system to use. And it's very intuitive. So the system comes with something called the wedge guard. Now, I have to whisper when I say this, but we shouldn't really, as, as dental surgeons, have to use this. 
uh, as I've just said, we should be able to prepare um, a class two preparation without damaging the adjacent tooth. But if you were concerned about it, uh, the wedge guard has this very thin metal sheet in it so that when you place your wedge, you also place a protective sheet between um, the adjacent tooth and the cavity that you're preparing, uh, which can be just lifted out afterwards. Uh, it does give you slightly greater confidence, although, as I say, I'm not entirely sure that, that we should have to rely on that. But it can be slightly more reassuring, especially if we're working next to something which has the potential to be damaged quite significantly. And you can see that this looks like this when it's in place. The mainstay still in dentistry, though, is circumferential bands, the Scofield matrix band, Toffelmeyer matrix bands. These are cheap. They are easily understood. Um, you have to learn a little bit about how to thread them sometimes. Um, but, you know, on balance, they are a good solution. However, they do separate the tooth at two points um, and they do require a, a wedge. Um, to hold them and apply them to the base of the cavity to avoid any material um, escaping through the base of the band. And that has the potential to traumatize the soft tissues at the same time. More importantly, it can be very difficult to get an anatomical contour and it often results in a poor contact. Sometimes as well, removing the band can be difficult. Um, and you may all be aware of situations even where you've, you've fractured the marginal ridge of a restoration. So the paladent system allows you to move away from this outcome that you can see in the top right, which is a picture as soon as this circumferential band has been removed. Um, it allows you to move to a situation where you don't have to spend so much time polishing away that excess composite and reshaping it. The evidence suggests from Dent Supply Serona that, that re represents um, around a fifth of your clinical time uh, with class two restorations is polishing. So if you use the Paladent system, then you can see that as soon as the matrix is removed, we already have a much more anatomical effect. It means that the time we have to spend um, shaping the restoration and polishing it is less, and we're much more likely to get a better outcome um, as you'll see when we look at the cross section in a second. So this is the, the Paladent system. Um, it's very similar to other sectional matrix systems on the market in that we have a tine which holds the sectional matrix into place, but it also slightly separates the teeth as well at the same time. Um, unlike amalgam, we can't pack composite in very tightly to create a contact. And, and historically, that's been a problem with circumferential bands. So we have a Teflon coated uh, sectional matrix here, which is non-stick. It has a greater curvature to give, as you've seen, a very good anatomical um, result. And the tines uh, slightly separate the teeth to give nice tight contacts with very minimal flash of material around the periphery. The gaps in the tines are compatible with multiple types of wedges, but then I do provide their own plastic wedges here, which you can stack as well. You can stack multiple wedges together if you need to. And we've mentioned the wedge guard already. So you'll all be aware of situations where you've placed a class two restoration, but um, the patient still complains they've got food packing or their floss is, is shredding. Um, and usually, if, as you can see on the picture, that's because your contact points are often very high and very tight. And that often happens um, because of the circumferential nature of the band and the very linear contour that it has. But if you're using a more anatomical solution, then your contact point is in a more appropriate place. It's slightly broader and more smooth. Uh, so food is less likely to get trapped um, around the, the gingival papilla. And also it's easier for floss to pass in and out of those contact points. There are two sizes of the night eye rings and the rings sit nicely over the wedges, as we've said already. Um, and you can stack multiple tines as well if you're doing multiple restorations. You also get some tweezers. Um, it's very tempting to want to pick these elements up 
uh, with your fingers or with tweezers, but actually you don't want to scratch the Teflon coated surface um, because it will transfer that finish onto the composite. You want to just pick them up using the little eyelets they have with the, um, the, twi the pin tweezers, which means that you're not damaging the surface at all. You can see here the little holes they have in them uh, at the top where the tweezers pick them up and allow you to insert them into proximally. So um, it is a good system. They're easy to use. Um, you have to choose the right contoured matrix, the right size for the application. Um, but more often than not, you get a very good outcome. Our undergraduates um, certainly find this an easy system to use uh, on the clinics. And this is what it looks like when it's in place. Um, it's quite an intuitive system. It's quite an easy system to use. What I always still say, though, um, to, to anybody, even though I'm talking to you on behalf of Dentsply tonight, is that you must always make sure that you have good adaptation at the base of your box uh, to the tooth tissue. So you should always be taking a probe and, and just pushing it against the base of your box because if you don't have adaptation down there or it's easily moving out the way, then your material, your restorative material will escape around there and you'll have a ledge or you'll have uncured material um, or you'll have a void. And if you don't have good adaptation, then you need to use different types of wedges or pack in other items such as PTFE tape to try and get good adaptation to the base of the box. That's really, really important. So this may be overload in the UK. We're now past eight o'clock in the evening. So um, I'm really keeping you, uh, you concentrating tonight. But um, I made this diagram for our students to try and get them to think about um, active bonding protocols. Um, and really what this is showing is that you really should think about the substrate that you're bonding to and what the optimal technique for bonding is. So if I just direct you to the, the dark blue column, you know, if you're mostly bonding to enamel, then really we should be using a total etch and rinse technique. Um, and you can see the direct bonding and the indirect bonding protocols that we might use uh, for those, largely etch and rinse um, for enamel. But if we go to dentine, if we're bonding mostly to dentine, we should be using a self-etching primer. We shouldn't continue to etch across the whole surface with phosphoric acid. We should be looking to do selective enamel etch um, and then applying self-etching primer to the dentine. And this is a, a scrub and cure, uh, a no-rinse self-etching primer solution, which helps to develop that hybrid layer. Um, and that's really important because it will make a difference to the longevity of your restorations if you're bonding to your substrates properly. And then if we think about situations where we've got sclerotic dentine, it's much more glassy, um, or we've got poor moisture control, then we might turn to you know, resin modified glass ionomers, um, but we also might look to modify the surface of the tooth with micromechanical mechanisms such as sandblasting um, or chemical bonding as well. So again, I don't want to labor this slide too much, but it's just to make the point that you, you really do have to think about your protocols for bonding to different substrates. In a lab, there's no doubt the three-step etch prime bond protocols are still the gold standard. They give the best bond strengths, but that is often based in on lab studies. And if we think about how you're managing things in your practice on a daily basis, with a patient sitting there and user compliance, then yes, self-etching primers and universal bonding systems will in theory compromise the bond strength, but actually they're easier to use and they're less technique sensitive. So practically they may give better outcomes because they're easier to implement as well. And not forgetting that whilst self-etching primers and universal bonding systems um, are slightly less good than the gold standard, they're still perfectly clinically acceptable. So at this point, I'd like to introduce you to Prime and Bond Active, which is uh, Dentsply Serona's most recent offering in terms of a, a bonding uh, system. Um, and it is uh, multimodal. It can be used 
as a self etch. It can be used to selectively etch enamel or it can be used uh, as a total etch and rinse. So unlike older systems where we had to have bottles A and B and they had to be kept in the fridge and they had a certain shelf life, this is a one bottle system which doesn't need to be in the fridge. And what's remarkable about it is that it gives reliable and predictable bond on over dry and over wet dentine. And this for me is really, really important because we know enamel has to be dry, um, completely dry for a resin bond. But dentine has to be hydrated to the point where it's considered to be moist. And I don't know about you, but I have absolutely no idea clinically how to determine what that point is. I don't know whether my dentine is over dried or over wet or just right. Where is that Goldilocks zone for your dentine hydration? And when I was a student, we were taught to dab uh, damp, cotton wool pledgets over the dentine to try and consistently reach the same level of hydration. But now we have a product which actually is going to do that for you. And it's got a very clever combination of um, different compounds in it, which drives off moisture uh, that shouldn't be there or hydrates dentine that is over dried to reignite and reinvigorate those collagen networks. So this is very, very interesting. It's probably one of my favorite innovations in recent years in dentistry, actually. Um, it's very, very clever. So this is Prime and Bond Active. So what you can see here is uh, different bonding agents being applied to water. And we're just using water because it just simulates a very over wet environment. And you can see what happens with the water is that most of the bonding agents on the market just try and ignore the water. They try and separate it off. Um, they're hydrophobic. Um, they don't really do anything with it. You can see now Prime and Bond Active though, um, as this is applied to the water, you can see it's starting to effervesce. It's starting to drive off that moisture and you're getting a much more homogenous surface. And why is that important? Well, if you imagine this being a tooth surface, then uh, you're going to have areas of your tooth surface with the other bonding agents which are not bonded at all. And if that happens to be at the margin, then you're going to get microleakage, you're going to get sensitivity, and you're going to get marginal breakdown. So I'm going to show you um, a photo here of dyed dye. So again, the tooth is uh, wet, over wet, and um, the bonding agents which have been dyed pink are going to be applied to the tooth surface. So here we've got Scotch Bond Universal, I Bond, and we've got Prime and Bond Active. And you see the same thing happening. Look at Scotch Bond, you can see the islands of water are retained in there. And you wouldn't see this in, uh, in the oral cavity yourself. It's, it's almost invisible to the eye. You can see the I Bond, again, forms a very strange surface. But the Prime and Bond Active gives you, despite the water being there, a very homogenous surface with no islands um, at the periphery um, you're maximizing the bonding area and you don't have areas of deficiency at the edge and that's really important because if we look here you know of these materials tested scotch bond universal gives the best bond strength but if you look at contamination with water at 25 percent and 40 percent then prime and bond active gives by far the best shear bond strength to dental hard tissues. The other thing that's really clever about it is the fact that it has a very high surface energy. So if you apply Scotch Bond Universal, Adhes or I Bond to a tooth, that's what happens. It sits there and you have to take your micro brush and you have to scrape it across the whole surface. But what's happening with Prime and Bond Active, as you'll see just now, is this very high wettability is taking the material across the surface of the tooth, which means you have a lot less work to do with your micro brush to spread it. And you also can be much more reliant on the fact that you're less likely to have areas of deficiency um, that are not bonded, especially if you think down into the base of a box in a class two restoration. <laughs> 
It's also very good at self-leveling. So if you apply air to some of these bonding agents, they ridge themselves, they become thinner and thicker in some areas. But you'll see when you air dry the prone bond active, that the resulting layer again is, is very homogenous, which is reassuring. And finally, uh, we have a very thin film thickness, which is the last circle here in blue um, with prime and bond active. And that's what we want. We don't want large film thicknesses of bond. So if we think here back to our clinical scenario again, we might have a margin which is slightly subgingival. Isolation might be difficult. Uh, you might be wanting to use a bit of retraction um, here, um, we do revert back sometimes to our amalgam restorations, but actually, if you're using prime and bond active as a bonding agent, it will significantly help you in these situations. I'd also like to mention SDR flow because this is a bulk fill flowable, which means that instead of building up incrementally your composite, you have the option to place up to four millimeters of height. Um, as a bulk flow in one cured stage um, and then cap with um, traditional composites on top. They will hopefully be of the dense bly serona family, Spectra, Spectra ST, but any of the dense bly family of composites uh, could be used, you know, even Spectrum. We use uh, all of them in, in the hospital at Cardiff. So I, I mentioned before the C factor and shrinkage and basically multiple walled cavities, deep cavities really rely on this layering technique to reduce this um, C factor stress. But, you know, the SDR, the smart dentine replacement bulk fill flowable means that's not necessary. And it has some very clever technology in it to mean that it, it doesn't stress the tooth in the same way uh, with its polymerization shrinkage. It has a degree of, of slippage in it as it's curing. Um, and if you look at the very technical aspects of composite chemistry, they develop a, a form of gel. There's a gel point in them as they go on their journey to fully curing. And the way in which the molecules move around in the composite during that gel phase ultimately determines the internal stresses that are built up. So in all of the dental companies are some very, very clever chemists um, that really understand steric hindrance. They understand the way molecules interact um, and interfere with one another and have come up with some very ingenious ways to reduce the shrinkage. So again, um, you can use SDR in one layer up to four millimeters, but you can also use it um, as a liner as well, which is very useful and it's self-leveling. So you get a very nice outcome, even in patients that um, are sitting in a position where you might consider a normal flowable to, to flow essentially and out of the cavity. Um, again, just to make the point here that there are some, some modulators in SDR which reduce the shrinkage stress. So a packable composite, you would need to manipulate it very carefully to get good adaptation at the base of a box. And I can't remember the study, but some people have looked at the, the maximum or the optimal agitation rate of composites. It's around six times a second to get it to flow because it's thixotropic. It has non-Newtonian pseudoplasticity. So it slumps under its own weight when it's agitated. Um, so, you know, some of the other systems that, that vibrate composites in an applicator um, do so because it gives better adaptation. It gives better application of the composite. But materials like SDR flow don't need to be agitated. They apply very well. Um, and you can see the difference here between the outcome um, when SDR flow is used as opposed to a posterior packable composite. And more recently, SDR flow plus comes in different shades. So we now have A1, A2 and A3 and a universal shade. Um, it's slightly more wear resistant and slightly more radio opaque than it used to be too. So it is a good option. Um, it's starting to be quite a good option for aesthetic reasons. Um, as opposed to just bulk fill, you can finish on smooth surfaces with SDR flow as well, which is great. Begin dispensing at the deepest part of the proximal boss and watch.
in ideal for use in maxillary posterior restorations. Self-leveling. We go. So again, we're coming towards the end this evening, and you're probably um, tired. You've been listening to me for a while, but I just want to show you some data that shows against a number of different products that SDR Plus has a very low shrinkage stress of bulk fill materials. So I think Densply are quite proud, probably quite rightly, of that data, um, and they're showing you here against some other market competitors and um, how that stress is minimised. There are some papers which you can look at to look at a fairly long follow-up, um, considering how quickly materials change um, of this, um, showing that basically the SDR is safe, it's acceptable, it's durable, um, and the clinical performance, the failure rate are actually not dissimilar to conventional layering. You can see that in, in a number of studies um, here that have been carried out for Dense supply, no significant difference in failure rates between bulk fill and layering are observed, and no post op sensitivities um, have been observed at all, which is, is good. It goes back to the point I was saying before about the value of really respecting the margins of your restorations. It's not so much really what goes into the your into the tooth, it's it's how the margins interact and behave over time. Um, again, I think Trevor's probably watching tonight, but I do make reference to this paper because um, it's very it's very important to understand the concept of of layering uh, with a, a posterior packable composite to give um, you know adequate curing, reduce the C factor, but also to give anatomy appropriate anatomy to your restorations, and you should be driven by the original cuspal form and contour of the tooth, building back each cusp will give you um, a fissure pattern. I don't believe that we should be carving in our own fissure patterns into teeth. It's difficult, it's unreliable, and really the anatomy of the individual tooth is governed by its cuspal form. That's what forms the fissure pattern in the first place, developmentally. So if you have a situation like this, where you're faced with some cuspal anatomy and missing most, then you can do a lot worse then building up incrementally each cusp back again. And what you will get as a result is a very appropriate fissure pattern. I'd also very quickly like to mention occlusion. Um, a lot of people fail to mark up contacts before they take a burr to the tooth to remove caries or to intervene operatively. Um, but it's, it takes a few seconds and it gives you very valuable information um, to allow you to actually restore, not to just refurbish, but to restore what you're doing back to the starting point again. That's really, really important. Also, just quickly to say that uh, Dent Splicer owners developed what's called the cloud shade um, of, of composites, which means that you don't have to have um, a composite for every single Vita shade, which is inefficient. And quite frankly, you end up with shades which are never used um, and some which are used too quickly. Um, but you'll see that their, their five cloud shades relate to all of the Vita shades, um, not in a particularly linear fashion. You have to look at which, which shade is related to which cloud shade. But they've got a chameleon effect. They work very well. Um, you have to try these to believe them, but they do work very well um, at, at matching the adjacent shades. So... With that in mind, um, that's all I would like to say tonight on Class 2 Restorations. Thank you for bearing with me. I hope it's been useful. Um, and I'm quite happy to try and answer any questions that you might have this evening. Okay, so let's have a little look at some of the questions that we've got. So one of the questions um, is from uh, Roseanne, and she's asking about biodentine, uh, which um, I haven't talked about tonight, my septodont, but a, a very useful material. How long do you leave it before providing definitive restoration, and how much do you leave underneath the definitive restoration? So that's a very good question. Um, 
one of the issues that manufacturers have had, I know the septidont worked for literally decades um, on biodentine, is that um, to have a type of, uh, of tricalcium or some kind of silicate cement that sets quickly is a real challenge. Um, so uh, these, rest, these types of materials can take a long time to go for a full face set. Sometimes it can be um, you know, 12 hours or more um, and that's that's a bit of a problem. Um, if I'm placing biodentine, then um, I would leave it at least several days um, before placing anything definitive, before cutting back and before packing straight onto it again. Um, I, I tend not to worry about how much I leave underneath because it, its mechanical properties are very, very similar to dentine. So um, in theory, you can leave a lot underneath. Um, you know, it's a very, very useful material. In that way but i'm going to get my wrist slapped for talking about biodentine uh, too much tonight um okay let's have a look for the question um iccms stands for the international caries classification and management system and if you put that into google you will be taken to the iccms website which has all of the information on there that you could need um, about that um Nissa is asking about what's a preferred material for subgingival cavities. Again, hopefully we've covered that tonight, but it's a very, very good question. I would be very hesitant about placing um, resin-based materials into, into deep subgingival cavities um, because uh, you, you might think that you've developed an effective resin bond strength, uh, but you probably haven't. Uh, and in time, you'll get marginal degradation. Um, and you'll get, um, you know, sensitivity, uh, probably even detachment at the base. Sometimes the, we never see these things until we end up taking a radiograph further down the line, um, by which case, you know, the, the memory of placing that restoration is, is long gone. Um, sometimes people try and elevate margins to make them more manageable, but the bit that's elevating still has to have longevity and still has to be robust. So in the end... Um, most of you probably won't like me for saying it, but amalgam is still one of the only materials which behaves very well. It's probably worth me saying at this point, there is a material which was developed by Dent Supply called Shorefill One, um, which isn't being produced at the moment, but is very recent, actually. It bridged the gap between amalgam and composite. It's very, very effective material for these kind of situations, but I haven't been able to talk about that tonight because... At the moment, it's not available, but Densply have worked very hard to try and develop a material like that. Um, so David, uh, Dave from Newcastle asks, um, do you think we should be lining deep caries lesions when restored with composite? And if so, with what? Well, again, as I was saying earlier, Dave, um, the evidence suggests that actually liners are of limited use and if you are going to line something um, and it's going to be something which um, is dissolvable, like um, setting calcium hydroxide, then we should completely cover that with another material like resin modified glass iron. Uh, and even then, uh, it should go nowhere near the periphery of the cavity. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Dave. Um, Steve, uh, hi, Steve from Sheffield, says... Um, Elution of monomers into urine and saliva is well recognized. Yeah, mainly the low molecular weight, hema, tegdma. Um, and another issue is that microparticulate waste and dust can cause issues for clinicians who dry finish and potentially the environment. So yeah, absolutely reinforcing those, those possible concerns with composites as we go forwards. Um, what do we think of the impact for primary care from 2025 when amalgam is scheduled for phase out um, in the EU. Um, well, again, Steve, I think it probably will impact very much. I think we still need companies and their chemists to continue to work on materials like Surefill One to make sure they're available for the market because there will certainly be alternatives to amalgam, but we just need to find that sweet spot between moisture tolerance and tooth tissue bonding um, and um, kind of durability, essentially. I'm sure they'll come. They will come. Um, other people will, will have a look at those. Um, okay, let's look at another question. Um, 
Thank you for all your comments, by the way, everybody. There's some really nice comments coming through. Um, Jonathan asks, can we elab can I elaborate on the tooth stamping prior to cuspal formation? So the, the occlusal stamp technique um, uh, kind of, it was trendy, probably still is a little bit trendy, but it was trendy maybe around five, 10 years ago um, to use some PTFE to lay over your occlusal surface of your tooth typically a molar or a premolar, um, and you would flow um, flowable onto the occlusal surface and use a micro brush, for example, to cure and pick up that stamp. Then you would prepare into the occlusal surface of the tooth um, and you would kind of place your bulk fill, uh, get up to the point where you've got a small amount of capping space left, um, and you would place your capping composite back on, but you would place your occlusal stamp back onto the surface of the tooth again. And in theory, it would give you the same occlusal form that you had before you started. It's a bit technique sensitive, but it can give some really nice results. Um, and of course, you are then actually ultimately restoring what you've done rather than just refurbishing the tooth. Um, Daniel says, uh, do you use brushes or flat plastics to get um, um, a bevel finish and how do you create the natural robustity of the cusps well what you see when you look at some videos of people using composite is they they play on its on its thixotropic nature so um you know using loops is definitely an advantage to look very carefully at how the material is behaving um, using flat plastics or, or materials and equipment like that alone makes it quite challenging you'll see some of the very aesthetic results come about by using uh, modeling resins and brushes um, to you know, move material around and to bunch it up. So um, when you look at the, the pictures I showed before from Lois McKenzie's paper, um, you know, applying composite towards the slopes of a cusp, but then encouraging it back up to the cusp slopes again from the base of the cavity, will allow it to, to bunch up and, and essentially, as you say, have that natural bulbosity. Um, you agitate it slightly and it flows. You know, the best outcome you're going to have is, is by placing your composite where you want it and curing it. We never get a good finish by having to go back in and cut things back. So always trying to use brushes, sculpting to get composite where you want it to be in the end is the best way. So hope that helps. And aside from that, I don't work in a high-end private practice. I work in a busy NHS hospital so, and, and undergraduate and postgraduate clinics. Most of the time, uh, we're just getting restorations that are um, correct in terms of form and function rather than very, very um, indetectable restorations. So that's not my area of expertise um, either. It's probably worth just saying. Um, how do I, okay, Daniel's asking, how do I prevent my sectional matrix from deforming on insertion? Um, and do dense ply offer any discounts to those who watch this? I don't know about, don't know about the last bit. Um, you have to, when, when I was in dental school, um, one of our professors, he wasn't quite a professor then, um, uh, Jimmy Steele, he said to me, he said to our group, and Dave, you may remember this, always floss, always floss before placing um, an interproximal matrix and and we said well why you know why should we do that and he said I don't know he said it just makes a difference and um, and do you know what it does it does make a difference and certainly when you have sectional matrices or circumferential matrices which buckle a little bit when you're trying to put them between the teeth for some reason just passing floss through first makes a difference so if you don't do that already give it a go um, don't come and find me if if you find it doesn't help. But for me, it certainly does. Um, so that's that's some advice I would give there. Um, and Amy from King's College London is a final year um, hygiene therapy student. Hi, Amy. Uh, lovely to have you here. She wants to know more about appropriate matrix selection and developing a good contact. Um, and there are some very good papers out there, um, Amy. And I know um, I'm pretty certain that Oliver Bailey from Newcastle has written some very good papers on, on the use of matrices. Um, Chris O'Connor from Newcastle. Um, there are certainly some in, in Dental Update. 
um, about you know how to use sectional matrices. So certainly go and have a little look. Um, and there's some there's some nice information out there on how to how to manage contact points um, and how to you know the benefits of using sectional matrices as I've mentioned tonight. Um, coming to the end now, I think. Um, Asma wants to know if we can use SDR as a filling material instead of a liner. Absolutely. Um, hopefully you've seen that we can use it as a bulk filling material and a liner. Uh, you can use it as both. Um, and finally, um, Ahmad asks from the University of Sheffield, do you believe using a, a bonding agent brush to adapt the composite will interfere with composite polymerization? Uh, no. But you you can't just use your bonding um, the, the bonding agent that you use on the clinics to manipulate composite um, on the surface because it will have primers in it um, and it might look nice and shiny to start with but over time they will hydrolyze they will degrade you'll get surface pitting um, and it's a bit of a false economy you can buy modeling resin you can buy unfilled resin. Um, as well uh, from the different companies, which is perfect for manipulating composite um, and it won't degrade because it's just a pure bonding agent. Um, again, a lot of people now, if they're, if they're doing things really carefully, will have a, an aqueous gel and um, they apply over the composite before they cure it on the occlusal surface um, to ensure they've got full polymerization and then they don't have any of the, the kind of inhibited surface layer which can pick up debris or, or fine particulate. In the end, the patient's going to go and have a meal and that's going to make very little difference um, on, on an occlusal surface of a posterior tooth. But if you really want a nice finish, then you could you could use that, follow that practice. Um, Maria asks, um, I've heard about biofilm removal prior to placing any restoration. Can I have your opinion on what we can do in the NHS where we don't have an airflow? Um, yeah, I mean, the tooth needs to be clean if you're going to restore it. Uh, certainly, if you're going to restore that surface, um, you see a lot of air polishing now that's around to help clean the surface, uh, which is obviously quite different to, to formal sandblasting, which has much more pressure um, and and can give much better outcomes. I wouldn't necessarily rely on, on the air abrasion or the airflow systems to do anything other than cleaning the surface. Um, biofilm removal... Um, again, you've got plaque, you've got calculus, which needs to be removed. Some people um, believe in treating the internal surfaces of um, cavities before you restore them to try and reduce the bio burden. Some people talk about the use of chlorhexidine or even hypochlorite around there. There are some interactions with, with collagen networks that might cause further degradation down the line of restorations. It's a bit of an inexact science. Um, to be honest, as so long as it's clean, um, either with ultrasonic or with um, kind of a paste um, or a pumice before you begin, um, I think that's probably as best as we can do as busy dentists. Um, Charlotte asks me about floss. I was just saying, Charlotte, that um, I was once given some advice that passing floss through contacts before you apply a matrix um, is very helpful. Um, with no real reason behind it, but it's I actually find it's true. Um, so it stops matrices from buckling um, when you try and, and pass, them, pass them through the contact. So just passing some floss through there first can help. Um, Santosh says, rubber dam for all restorations. I'm not sure if that's a statement or, or if it's a question. Um, I try, I, I've got a bit of a soap box. It hasn't had rubber in it for a long time. So I, I tend to try and use the term dental dam um, wherever I can. And I do agree, wherever possible, we should be using it. We should put it on wherever we can for patient comfort, safety, isolation. It's just, it's just a good thing to do. Um, probably will give better outcomes. And of course, the more you do it, the quicker you get at it, the more comfortable you are with it. Um, definitely, definitely the way forwards. Um, okay, I think at that point, um, pretty much been through all the questions that I can see. So thank you so much, everybody, for, for your engagement tonight. I've talked for quite a long time, so <laughs> apologies for that. Um, if any of you would like to get in touch with me separately to ask any questions, then you can find me online. If you just put James Field Cardiff into Google, you'll find 
where I am. Um, and if that's the case, I'll see you on the other side. So thank you very much. I hope you have a nice evening.